This is incredible. I can't believe I'm on this stage. I feel like I'm in the Eurovision Song Contest or something. It's amazing. <laughs> but, um, okay. So, I'm in the post-break slot, mid-afternoon. We're all kind of, you know, waiting out for the party to happen. And I thought I might start my talk with just really embarrassing myself. Um, and here we go. Here it is. <laughs> That's me. I was 19. Look how beautiful I look in my scout uniform. Yeah. This is uh, me receiving my Queen Scout Award, actually. I've been to Windsor Castle and everything. It's like the highest award that you can get in, in scouting. And um, are you impressed? <laughs> you should be. Check out my woggle. <laughs> now... You may notice that I've got a really nifty belt on there, okay? You can't really see it. But if you're, if you, and who was a scout here? They were a venture scout. Okay, yeah, cool. Does anyone know what a, an, that belt is? Can't see. Oh, okay. This is a, an explorer belt, okay? So in uh, 95, I was 18. Believe it or not, I am that old. I'm over 40. <laughs> um, I did my explorer belt. So the explorer belt is when you walk around a foreign country for 10 days and you carry all your stuff that you might need on your back in a huge rucksack. So there was me and one other girl walking around the Netherlands. We picked the Netherlands because it's flat. <laughs> Very important criteria in our choice of country. Um, and they also do chips and mayo, which was cool. So, yeah, we spent 10 days walking around the Netherlands. Um, we had nowhere to sleep um, other than the tent that we were carrying. And every night we had to find somewhere new to camp on our route. So this involved knocking on doors in our, like, scout thing, saying, neckerchief, sorry, on the woggle, saying, um, could we sleep in your garden? Could we maybe pitch a tent on the village green? So you can imagine the kinds of predicaments we could have got ourselves into. One night we had to sleep in a chicken farm, which I wouldn't recommend, it really smelled bad. And um, yeah, another night we actually slept in someone's spare room, which, thinking about that now as a mum, and my daughter is a scout, that would worry me <laughs> quite a lot. But anyway, so the purpose of this is to find out about the culture, the food, the beliefs of that, that particular country, and you're supposed to talk to lots of people while you're there. It was probably one of the hardest things I'd done at that point, um, and I twisted my ankle several times during, during that time, but I did it, and I got that belt that you saw. That was what I got for that. <laughs> so, this is what the... Uh, this is what the Scout Association say about the Explorer Belt today, because it's changed a little bit since then. The Explorer Belt is a challenge of a lifetime. It is a chance to take part in a 10-day expedition that brings you a real understanding of a different country, its culture and way of life. You will develop this understanding by traveling through your chosen country, working as part of a small team to complete a series of projects, and most importantly, meeting local people. So it's an experience and achievement you'll remember for the rest of your life. I can't say that's true, actually, but because um, I completely forgot about it until I was going through some old photos and found that awful picture that I put up to, for you earlier. So you may wonder why on earth I'm going on about scouts and showing you pictures from my photo albums. Well, you may have got the link, hopefully, but I think that um, discovery research is a lot like being an explorer going on a journey, going on an expedition. Would you agree? Yeah. yeah? So, I, like I said, I think of discovery research like a journey. And I think, as researchers, our role is to be on that journey or that expedition. So, Danny talked about some of this. Um, the reason that I put this slide up is because I'm a bit of an imposter and I... 
even though I've done a lot of research over sort of the past 18 years, I still feel like I don't know all there is to say about discovery research. But actually what I've learned through this time of doing research with these organisations and for these organisations is that the key role of a researcher is not necessarily to be the best researcher or to do all the research, but it's to be a facilitator of the research process on behalf of others. And so during the next 20 minutes, I'll talk you through some ways you can facilitate the discovery research journey on behalf of your team. As Dan Brown says, it's as much about the journey as what you find along the way. I think it's a great quote. I um, don't know if you've seen Dan Brown's brilliant A Book Apart book um, on discovery, but you should definitely read it. Okay, so let's pause here and talk about whether this should be a solo expedition or a group expedition that you're on when you're doing discovery. So I have quite a strong view on this. And it, it's, it's come from ever since I did my first home visits project way back when at the BBC. Good, I don't know, 12, 13 years ago now. I very much believe that you shouldn't fly solo when you're doing discovery research. I saw then firsthand how being immersed in a research expedition could really help unlock the insights um, in the minds of the people taking part. I sent senior managers, commissioning editors, to visit the audience in Wales, um, student nurses, people you know, at the valleys, down living, you know, lots of different kinds of people from different backgrounds, and, and they got a lot out of doing that. There are other reasons uh, for that as well, because the journey may be long. So think about some discovery processes. They can take months and months. Um, and you may just disappear off on that journey on your, on your own. You may also need to travel far from home. So you may need to go and visit people living in far-flung corners of Wales. Or you may need to you know, go to uh, workplaces that are very different from your own. And there's a real danger that you can get lost in the thick of the forest and literally disappear. So what I mean by that is, who's ever had a mountain of insights or data that they've, they've got during a discovery process that they're just kind of like, I don't know what to do with this. And you just kind of go, go in and then you just focus inward and you don't communicate with anyone. Anyone? Yeah. Okay, we've all been there. So Will, I'm quoting Will, because he just wrote this great blog post last week about... Um, Use the research as a team sport. Um, I agree with well. Big reveal research doesn't work. I think it's about facilitating that journey, like I said, for a group expedition. There are circumstances when research happens in a silo, but you need to think of the ways you can make it a team sport, if you're, even if you're the one on that solo expedition. Because you could end up... So if you can see here, this is the research graveyard. Quite a lot of my projects have ended up in the research graveyard, sadly, um, where I've done this amazing research, again, about what Will was talking about, having impact, but no one else was along for that ride with me. And however amazing you can make your PowerPoint presentation or tell the story of the research, it doesn't necessarily have the impact if the people that you're delivering that to weren't, weren't along with you for that ride. They may just put that on a shelf and discard it afterwards. So it's not about wrapping up your research in a bow and delivering it. The cost of doing that um, is, too, is too great, really. So discovery expeditions are for teams, definitely. Like I said, facilitate that journey, bring everyone along with you, including the client or the rest of the team. But like I've said a couple of times, what if everyone can't come along on that journey with you? What if they're too busy? They're senior executives, perhaps, and they're in meetings. You still need to keep in touch with them. Maybe send them... They may be loved ones, they may not be loved ones. Maybe send them postcards anyway. Keep a journal, log where you've been, what your reflections are. So, as researchers... We are expedition leaders. So 
So next time you're thinking about discovery research, what do you, what do you tend to do when you're planning discovery research? Do you jump straight to processes, methods, how are we gonna do this? Or do you ask these questions? Who do you want the group or the team to meet? What questions do you want to ask? What do you want the group to see or hear? By the group, I mean your team. What else do you want to find out about? Where will the journey take you? What route will you take? And what do you want the group to bring with you? If you're thinking about planning an expedition, these are all the sorts of things you'd think about. I think it's the same, same thing to think about for discovery research before you jump straight into, we're gonna conduct stakeholder interviews and then we're gonna do 15 uh, depth, depth interviews. So like I said, I think you need to ask, answer these questions before you jump into how. So as Lisa said, this is from um, the DTA blog actually, where she moved, first moved to Australia. Discovery is for discovering, not validating. I think even in planning our research methods, we should think about discovering new ways of working. When we are lazy with our methods, we risk the run sorry, we run the risk of biasing our outcomes. By not speaking to the right people or going to the right places, we learn what we already know. So we need to discover new methods. I often see, like I said just a minute ago, I often see a very typical type of um, research plan for discovery. Uh, maybe looking at analytics, maybe talking to stakeholders, maybe doing some user interviewing. Kind of safe and often very appropriate if you haven't got a huge budget from a client or you haven't got a lot of time if you're in-house. That's often um, appropriate in those circumstances. But there are hacks, there are tweaks you can make to even that process that can just improve what you do. So I'm just going to talk you through now a few uh, ideas for some hacks or some new, you know, new methods. So gamification, these are two examples here um, that I found. Um, shout out to Andy Bird who put me in the, in, um, sorry, highlighted the paper giant example there on the left only, I think it was a couple of days ago. And then IDEO is the one on the right hand side. So these are just games that you can, you can use in the planning stage, particularly really helpful. Just give you to think about new tasks. Um, maybe within an interview situation, you could use this thinking about that discussion guide and chunking up that, say, hour that you've got with someone. Think about some new ways of talking to people or getting them to do different things within that, that time that you've got with them rather than doing the same old um, talking, talking, talking. That's one way. Okay, so... Pre-tasks, it's not something that I've heard user researchers talk a lot about, but it's something that market researchers use an awful lot in focus groups. Sorry, I just mentioned focus groups. <laughs> Don't kill me. <laughs> they have their place. Um, so yeah, the market research industry use pre-tasks a lot of the time. Um, they are basically short tasks or homework that you will give to respondents or participants, and they're incentivized to do them. So they're asked to bring that along to a focus group or interview, um, or do something like a diary study um, as part of the research process. So this example's from Pilotworks. Um, in Bristol, they're a small consultancy, and this was a piece of work they did for the University of Bristol. So instead of running a standalone diary study, something that I see quite a lot in UX, they actually used it as a pre-task, which is a great idea and something that I've done um, in the past as well um, at Radio Wells. What they did was ask first year undergraduates to fill in a diary on DScout, you can see here, this platform, um, and talk about their, the, the first few weeks of life at university. And then they used that not just for the insights that that gave them to present back to the client, but also as a focus for discussion in the interviewing process. Panels. Okay, so one of the things that I found to be quite challenging about discovery research is the recruitment. 
So it can be very costly. You might need to talk to a lot of different types of people if you're thinking about a really broad set of users because you're not sure who are your users at that stage, right? So it can get very expensive. It can get very um, time consuming. One of the leaner ways of doing this is to have a panel recruited. So you can do it in sort of two ways. Um, you can get someone to do it completely for you. So Verve over on the left are a market research company that, that set up communities, research communities, and um, they call them pop-up communities. They also do long-term panels as well. Um, but with these pop-up communities, you can say recruit people for three months and then design a number of research tasks to um, use uh, to uh, ask or yeah, um, sorry, I'm getting mixed up with my words. Yeah, you've designed a number of research tasks to use with the community over that period, and they're incentivized, and someone obviously manages that process for you. CrowdTech um, is a piece of software that I found that you can do this yourself if you don't want to commission someone to do it for you. So if this is something that you want to try in-house, there are platforms out there, such as CrowdTech, I think DScout, you can do similar things on, and I'm sure there's a bunch of other ones that I just haven't found. Yeah, it's, um, it's something to think about. You have to just obviously be aware that there's quite a, a high amount of management involved. You need to keep those participants warm, you need to keep them engaged, and you need to keep trickle-feeding the research tasks across the time rather than just doing one hit of interviews with them. So projective techniques. Again, these are used a lot in qualitative market research, particularly in focus groups, where you may be talking to groups of people for up to two hours. It can get really, really boring for people to be just talking in a room for two hours. So quite often, these types of techniques are used to break that up and to make things more interactive um, and more interesting. So if focus groups aren't your thing, workshops, or even in interviews, you can use these techniques. They're really helpful for uncovering bias um, and subconscious needs that you might not be able to get from just simply talking to people. Um, these here are from a blog post written by Mustard Research. Um, and there's a lot more on their blog post if you want to have a look at some more. So they can often be useful for things that are difficult for people to talk about. For example, how they're feeling. Um, if they're in a workshop situation, they may not want to talk about very you know, personal things in front of other people who are strangers, perhaps. But also things like brand perception, which is a really hard thing to ask someone. And it gets you beyond that. If, the, if you know, brand X was a car, what kind of car would it be? Which is a productive technique, but I haven't included it here because I know everyone hates that. So withdrawal methods. Sounds a bit strange, but it's basically basically what it what it yeah you ask a consumer to withdraw withdraw from using something. So you can do it um, uh, you can do it hypothetically. So you can ask in a in an interview, how would you feel if you couldn't use your mobile phone for you know two weeks? Get them to think that through, or you can do it literally, and you incentivize the participant or the respondent to actually go without the service, the software, the, you know, the product, whatever it is that you're working on. Um, you can use this technique uh, in a wider ethnographic study. So using something like DScout or the panel software that we looked at, you can ask people to go without, again, using um, you know, Facebook um, for two or three weeks and then get them to add that to a diary um, and maybe have a group of other people on there talking about how they're all feeling together um, and moderate that discussion. The outputs can be quite dramatic and quite, quite revealing. So mood boards. As design professionals, we're obviously all very familiar with mood boards. Um, and in terms of consumer research, I think they're, they're really, really useful. I've seen them done really well. They are very time-consuming, though. So if you're thinking of doing this technique, you probably wouldn't want to do it in a 
in a one hour interview because it would take up half of your interview. You can use it perhaps in a workshop situation, in a group situation, because they work better when people are working together with each other. What you can do is draw out interesting discussions around why they've, they're picking a particular thing to go on their mood board. It's useful, again, for things like brand perceptions, where people find it hard to articulate why they feel that way about a brand, but they can, you know, obviously use something to represent that um, beyond words. Uh, again, I've used this at the BBC when I was doing work on Radio Wells, and it was, it was really interesting, actually, to see, uh, see what people brought out when we asked them to talk about their relationship with BBC Radio Wells. It wasn't just daffodils and leeks and dragons, it was went a bit deeper than that. Time machine. So it's a technique you can use to simulate future thinking. Because sometimes people struggle with that. And obviously, you should never ask people, what would you like this to look like in the future? Because that's never a good idea. But you can get people talking about this in a more productive way. So you, as an example, you ask a participant to think back to what perhaps, say, children received for Christmas 30 years ago, and they talk briefly about what children receive these days for Christmas, and then you ask them to think about the future. Then you repeat the process to talk about the subject in question. Simple as that. Psycho drawings sound a bit... Basically, stick men and women, <laughs> thought bubbles... And, and speech bubbles. They're very useful, again, for helping people to articulate feelings on things that are a bit uncomfortable to talk about, that how would that make you feel question. Um, but also it helps people to project onto someone else um, about their experiences with a service. So they, you can ask them to say, what do you think most customers would say about their experiences of this service? Write it in the speech bubble, as opposed to saying, what do you think? It becomes them talking about someone else, which can, you know, can be helpful for people. Lastly, bring an item. Um, again, it can be used as a pre-task, as well as a projective technique. So you, at the point of recruitment, respondents are asked to bring an item to the interview that, that represents or that, or that they associate with, say, the brand or the product. So... And it could be uh, quite a good icebreaker um, if you're doing a workshop or a group situation. But equally, I think it works quite well for, um, for interviewing. You can use these again in terms of um, panels where you can ask people to upload photographs, perhaps, or um, you know, snapshots of, of things that they think en encapsulates um, the brand. It doesn't have to be a physical object. OK, so those are a few different ideas, hopefully you've learned something different. We haven't really talked about discovery, so Danny sort of touched on this at the beginning and talked about formative and evaluative research. Well, I think there's like this kind of dogma around the discovery phase, right? So here's the design squiggle. Um, discovery's kind of at the start there, yeah? And then here's GDS's how they work. We've got discovery de very definitely happening there at the start. We've also got the double diamond, and this is my favourite version by the wonderful Jane Austen from Now She's Moved to Babylon Health. So I think discovery is at the start there, but it's a little bit less clear to me, and I'll tell you why in a minute. So I'm really glad that Dan put up a funnel earlier because I've got my own funnel and this is my version of, of a funnel. So this is how I think about research and how I talk about research. And I developed this when I was working at my last job at Monotype. And I joined there as the first user researcher in the company. And the first thing I did was to understand the research landscape, what was happening at Monotype. I knew that there was research happening, even though there weren't researchers, um, and I needed a way to, to talk to, to research, talk about research to people, sorry. So I did some interviewing, I did a survey, and through all of these conversations and things, I kind of just came up with this, really, um, and iterated on it after talking to people. 
It became a, a good way of talking about research in the organisation, and it became a good way to good thing to point people to when we were having conversations. So when the team grew slightly, and um, we were able to say, this is where we can add value. These are the things you should probably keep on doing yourself because we, um, like Will was saying again, I keep pointing to Will's talk, but um, yeah, there were, there were places where we just couldn't do all that research. So we could say, look, here's some guidance, here are some templates, here's some best practice. Go away and do that type of research without our input. And here, here's the stuff where you really should get us involved. So anyway, that's the background. So the funnel is really about how far away or how close to a problem you are. So I'm going to try and use the laser. Here, at the top, <laughs> sorry, I'm enjoying that. Um, we have exploratory research. So we're really far away from the problem there. We may not even know what on earth the problems are that we're trying to solve. So this is all like blue sky thinking, hence the, hence the blue. And then as we go down the funnel, we get closer to the problem. And right down here, we're probably sort of in solutioning around here. And probably in tactical, we're maybe thinking about, you know, refining the solutions that we've got. And then down here, we're thinking a lot about, um, you know, measuring um, how we're doing, maybe by benchmarking um, key metrics. So that became our way and our sort of framework for research at Monotype. Um, and I, um, it's really useful, actually, to me still, since I've left. Um, so if you think about problem solving like a funnel, that you can move, you, by the way, you don't just move down it, you can move back up it. Um, you start to think about continuous research rather than phasing research. So this is Teresa Torres, who talks a lot in product, um, product management circles. So with continuous research, we're changing the process from did we get it right to help create this with us. So she's a big advocate for um, talking to customers weekly um, and continuously doing discovery. So she's got, um, oh, in fact, I've got the blog a little bit further on, so I'll come to that in a minute. But yeah, the story doesn't stop. It continues, it changes. So discovery isn't just done. If you, know, if you do it in that phase at the start, sorry, that phase, at the start of those diagrams we were looking at, behavior alters and adapts. And I think too often we're thinking in a validation mindset when we're in the solution space. Um, but if you keep engaging with your customers early and often, you'll start to develop that sort of co-creation mindset. So discovery should be a mindset that we all adopt, not just think of as a phase of research. If we come back to Jane's uh, double diamond, discovery can happen right... Oh, sorry, press the wrong one, got excited then. Discovery can happen right across, across generative and across evaluative. So this is Teresa's blog. Um, there are other people talking about continuous discovery as well, but I think she's got a whole body of work on it, and she talks quite regularly at things like Mind the Product. So if you're interested in digging more into this, I'm not an expert, but she really is. Um, yeah. Um, thinking about that, so this is a, an example from Optimizely, who do discovery Kanban, and they have a discovery Kanban process. This is their physical wall that they have in their office, um, and this blog post talks about how they, how they do discovery on a weekly basis. So they have a weekly cadence of research, and they prioritise items that they, they have research questions, they go in the backlog, they move into to-do, um, and then they obviously go through these stages of prep, researching, synthesising and socialising. Um, and they keep that track going alongside the delivery, uh, iterate, uh, sorry, the evaluative track. So I did something similar at Monotype, and this is, um, please don't look too closely at it. It's, uh, don't want to get the lawyers, uh, but it is from <laughs> last year, so it's, it's all completely out of date anyway. Um, yeah, so this was something I did for, one, for a couple of our um, uh, font products that I was the lead researcher for. So we had a monthly cadence because we were such a lean team. So on, once a month we'd get together and talk about all the 
you know, all, well, all the desired things we wanted to know. Then we'd prioritise them and think about what we had capacity to do that month. And we'd put them into scoping. Someone would go off and say, OK, I can do that. Um, and then they'd go into, you know, proposed if we decided it was viable and so on. We had similar then um, headings to, to the last one I showed you, if they were actually ended up being a thing. What was really good about this was that um, it enabled us to take a mixed methods approach. So we weren't just thinking about, you know, qualitative interviewing. Um, you can see the people on here. One of my colleagues, um, the head of data and analytics, we sort of partnered on these and we would just tackle it with whatever means we had. So the product management team would maybe go away and talk to sales teams to find out more about what the customers were thinking. The designers might um, plan an A-B test or um, Nathan, my colleague with the data and analytics um, guy, would go off and you know, do some looking in the analytics. I may plan some, you know, some bespoke research. So it just enabled us all to kind of get around these different questions and figure out how we were going to understand um, and move forward. So lastly, look, there's Dan. <laughs> I put that up earlier. And here's Thomas Sharon's um, Principles of Atomic Research. I think that type of approach that I've just been talking about works really well um, for atomic research because you're focusing around key small manageable things um, and then obviously it's, it's this type of approach then you need to think about how you're going to manage that knowledge as an organisation and not just kind of throw it away. So some of these types of ways of thinking are really useful for us. Okay, so we've completed the discovery journey and hopefully you've learned some things along the way. Here are the takeaways in case you didn't get them. Think of discovery as an expedition, and you are the expedition leader. Make sure that you bring your team along in any way you can, and avoid that research graveyard. Make sure you discover some new methods along the way, and above all, keep discovery as your mindset. And I think you'll all do great. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.